Irene, I'm in. This is Rose Basau. I know, Rose. I saw you. I'm glad I can hear you now. I, yeah. Yes. Um, so it's kind of a lot of Yeah. Um, so, and so, yeah, we're going to mute everybody so that um, when Mike starts, then we are not. Um, um, and Gerald, I see you there as well. Uh, Chris Arms, I see you there. Bella, I see you too. So it's good. Um, so as we, we continue logging in, um, if you have questions, type them on there at the chat space so that uh, we'll pick them up from there. John's coming in. There he is. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Uh, Finn, Davy, I see you. Sorry, I was on mute. Hi, how are you people? Oh, we are very good and we are coming Hello. along nicely. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Ambassador. Good to see you. Mike is here too, John. Yes, I've just seen his, uh, his noble visage. <laughs> noble visage. <laughs> oh, um, sorry, did you hey, say... John, John, it's been a long time. How are you doing? Ah, very well. Ah, la, 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 la. Yes, Good well. heavens. <laughs> How are you, sir? <laughs> it's a small world. Very small world. I'm great, thank you. Yeah, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to give um, Cecilia, you're driving this. How many more minutes for people to join in? They're coming along nicely. Um, yeah, we have 33. Yeah. Ooh. Up to thirty five now. Okay. Do, 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 do. So, John, are you still working normally or have you slowed down or is it <laughs> easier, better? I've, I've, I don't know. I've just finished a Zoom a board meeting 10 minutes ago for the Muthaga Country Club at where we were discussing what to do with COVID. Open the, the restaurant, John. Open eh? the restaurant. Open the <laughs> restaurant, he says. <laughs> <laughs> the impact you've, got a, you've got a huge garden just spread the tables around it <laughs> and when a, when somebody be, becomes infected we, we'll, we'll pretend it wasn't from there yeah. <laughs> he doesn't know how to slow down <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Awendo Yes, sir. You're good? I'm good, thank you. Working from home. Do these uh, distinguished gentlemen and, and ladies know that we, we once worked together? That I no, no, I, I, I doubt it very much. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Jeff Odundo might know. I don't think so. He's on Toto. No, no, no. I was, was there, John. Com he was at Combank <laughs> during those days. Um, from oh. Ambank House days, John. From Ambank exactly. House. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an old geese, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. Jeff, nice good night. to see you. Welcome. Yes, I'm at home. Just uh, observing the protocol. <laughs> yeah, I see that. So yeah, we are going to meet you in a little bit, but uh, it's good that you're here. I hope you have some good words of wisdom for us because we are not going to, um, as everybody has noticed, we are not doing uh, targeted business topics today. We simply mm -hmm. want to be um, gain some EQ from all of you, from UJ, from uh, Ambassador, from Mike and from John. So it's a little about um, how to keep it together while we wait for this phase to define itself and perhaps for us to get over it. So yeah, we'll be waiting to hear from you. Um, okay. Cecilia. We've I was gonna say we've reached the magic 40. So. Yeah, so 
perhaps mm -hmm. it's uh, as people join, we are gonna so start um, and this is where I'll ask that we mute our, our side of um, Zoom so that we, we I'm keep- I'm about to mute everybody. Uh, everybody. Uh, and then uh, those speaking, unmute yourselves. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so yes, we are going to start and I will say thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Oh, I said tuning in, that's my TV language from, yeah. Um, I'm glad that uh, you could join me this evening and uh, with my co-host Cecilia. Um, my name is Irene Gadiaka. Um, a lot of you know me from hosting these, um, these business forums, the Nairobi Business Forum. We do this every, every month, um, except for the last two. We were trying to find a way to cope with COVID and we hoped that it would go away before we had to Zoom, but that is not the case. And um, I also, um, I am also the Africa Director for Total Impact Capital. Um, that's an investment fund. It's headquartered in Washington, D.C. Um, mm -hmm. um, a lot of that is on the website. I have with me my co-host, Cecilia. She wears, uh, Cecilia Wandiga, she wears many hats. And among them is that she's a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. Um, she will tell you more about herself um, uh, maybe as we go. But for now, what I want to do without um, wasting time, and since we only have an hour, is to um, call upon Mr. Mike Eldon. Mr. Mike Eldon has been a past speaker on this forum, and um, the reason why he is among the people that um, we've invited tonight to speak is that every time I speak to Mike, I take a nugget of wisdom with me. And it's the same for Ambassador Dennis Awari and for Mr. Jeff Odundo. There is always something uh, that I take with me every time I talk to these gentlemen. And I thought it wise to share that knowledge with, uh, with all of us. And perhaps we'll leave tonight a little bit, you know, wiser on how to deal with the current times. And so, Mike, I'll leave it to you to um, introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, um, Irene, and uh, it's good to be with you all again. Uh, last time uh, when I spoke, we were uh, on Riverside Drive at Le Grenier Pain, and I'm very sorry we can't be there this evening to taste their goodies. I know. Um, uh, uh, I know you've been meeting at different places since. Irene, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to introduce my uh, good buddy, uh, John Gumi. Um, and uh, let me just uh, take this opportunity to let everyone know, in case um, many people do not, that you've recently been inducted into our Rotary Club of, of Nairobi. Uh, Dennis, uh, sorry, um, we, we took her, but um, she can visit you uh, anytime. Uh, and we're very happy to, to have um, Irene with us sure she'll make a good contribution. So my role here this evening um, is to introduce uh, John. Um, he's already trying to butter me up a couple of minutes ago by referring to my noble visage. Um, and of course, everyone knows that I'm really Prince Charles. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to be um, quite lengthy, actually, about John, because after all, he's had such a full 40-year career, much less than mine, of course, but um, get ready to blush, John. John is still best known for his many years uh, as an investment banker, where he was such a trailblazer. And during this time, he played transformative roles in developing our regional capital market and the regulatory frameworks underpinning these markets, and also in persuading governments to see these markets as critical to the mobilization and allocation of resources. His banking 
career started at NatWest Bank in the UK, and he joined there as a trainee in 1980, when I was already very advanced in my career. After graduating from Oxford University with a first class honors degree in politics, in philosophy, politics, and economics. And I need to mention here that others who've benefited from this PPE degree include David Cameron, Bill Clinton, the current editor of The Economist, and for good reason, this PPE has been dubbed the degree that runs Britain. So no wonder that John is helping to run Kenya. On his return to Kenya in 1983, John worked for Greenleys Bank, Citibank, Barclays, Standard Bank of South Africa, and he co-founded one of Africa's first locally loaned owned investment banks, Loita Capital. He led path-breaking transactions in diverse sectors, pioneered many of the finance techniques that are now still very much in use in the region. He started Standard Bank's East Africa Investment Bank from scratch, oversaw its rise, arranging and lead managing a mere $8 billion in transactions, primarily debt capital, project finance initially, but then moving on to equity, mergers and acquisitions. To avoid any conflict of interest, John left Standard Bank in 2015 when President Kenyatta appointed him as non-executive chairman of Kenya Pipeline. And John frequently refers to the fact that he's only too aware of the limitations of his non-executive status. Maybe he'll tell us a bit about that. Prior to this, President Kibaki had appointed him to be the inaugural chair of the Konza uh, Technopolis, laying the groundwork for Kenya to become our uh, continent's silicon savanna. It's also served as an inaugural director of the Communications Commission, which oversaw the creation of Kenya's present telecommunications landscape. And he played a key role in the development of Kenya's pension fund management industry, from its small beginnings to its present major status. And this goes <laughs> on forever. I think he must be 120 years old. He was the only private sector representative of the team that established the Retirement Benefits Authority. It's important to state that John played and plays a key role in familiarizing our technocrats, um, our officials in the treasury uh, with how the international capital markets work. And very much as part of this was when he led Standard Bank in playing the co-lead arranger role in Kenya's $600 million syndicated loan and in the country's inaugural major uh, Eurobond. And all this was thanks to his uncanny ability, his unique ability to operate at the nexus of the Kenya public and private sectors. He also has held various board positions, he's still an advisor. As I said, I've known John for many years, not least in the context of KEPSA, where we're both members of its advisory council, which by the way, was established by its then chairman, who happened to be Dennis Awori. <laughs> in KEPSA, we can never get enough of John's contributions, not least through his WhatsApp messages on our group. He enters an annual period of self-imposed silence during Lent, and he has just emerged from this year's Trappist self-isolation. Here's from his recent comeback communication, like all his others, with no typos whatsoever, commenting on the not uncommon whining and moaning traffic that preceded it. Future generations, wrote John, will marvel at our self-imposed limitations, born out of fear, analysis paralysis, and as someone, not me, someone must do something about this approach to the challenges we confront as a nation. Five years of chairing the KPC board have taught me that there is nothing that cannot be done if the will to act and the intelligence to know what to do are present. Let's stop pining for John Michuki and his ilk. Let us become our own John Michukis 
and overcome our biggest problem, which is fear. Is this Winston Churchill or uh, John and Gumi? A couple of years ago, I was running a workshop for leaders from around the continent on how they should communicate in times of crisis. And I invited John to come and share his experiences at this. You can just imagine how much we benefited from his insights, given the way his heroic efforts to fix what needs fixing had consistently provoked the nastiest of pushback. John's overriding goal is to see Africa freed from economic hopelessness. Oh, and to see the reopening of the restaurants at the Matheka Country Club, of course, where he's a member of the committee. Ah, if only we had more John Ngumis among us. It's great to have you here, John, and we look forward to hearing from you about our theme for today, about doing business in this time of COVID. And of course, we're also looking forward to hearing from those two other wonderful guys, both great buddies of mine, like many others I'm seeing on the screen here, uh, Dennis and Jeff. So if you finish, have you finished blushing now, John? Are you okay to start? You're relaxed enough? Well, Mike, you did a good job in making me feel, uh, wow, was that me or, or was that an avatar? It's you. <laughs> Thank you. And so, okay. um, yeah, you go ahead, John. Well, I was asked to start very unusually, not with saying anything, but with introducing a couple of people to say something about our subject for tonight. So, my old friend, Ambassador Awari, Take the floor, so to speak, and gives us your give us your pearls of wisdom. Thank you, John, old friend. Um, I've known you since we were wearing shorts, but I, you know, and I thought I knew all about you. But anyway, it's great to be here. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, and thanks to all of you who will give me a couple of minutes just to talk about uh, the COVID disruption, as, 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 as I call it. Um, first, first of all, we were in the middle of being disrupted anyway um, by, by digitalization. And then the, the pandemic hits and overnight, our world screeches almost to a halt. And even the disruptors that were in existence uh, were themselves disrupted. And I, when it screeched to a halt and uh, restrictions were put in, we all thought, uh, okay, the restrictions are in for 21 days. Let's double that. And, uh, and after a couple of months, we could expect to go back to normal. No, not going to happen. We're, this is our new normal. So what did we do? And, and I hope that by describing what, what we did at, at my day job, uh, which is the CFAO Toyota Group here in Kenya, that uh, I will answer in, a, in part, the, the questions that we're, we're looking at today. First, we, we, we came up with um, business continuity plans, like everybody, uh, for each of the eight companies in different sectors, from, from the uh, motor industry to the uh, agricultural sector to, to the energy sector. Um, uh, and, and to the pharmaceutical distribution sector. And in those business continuity plans, we looked at the three scenarios, minimum lockdown, partial lockdown, curfew, and total lockdown. But we could never have truly seen what um, 
what, what, what was about to hit us. Revenues plunged nearly 40% in some cases, including surprisingly for our pharmaceutical distribution business. Uh, the phrase cash is king took on new meaning uh, because now we had to make sure that we could survive even with, with, uh, with these, this big drop in revenues. We were at the tail end of our last financial year, which finishes in March, and things that we had hoped to do like pay bonuses, uh, put in new capital expenditures, uh, recruit new people, all had to go. Thank God we haven't had to cut salaries because we did have enough um, money to keep, keep going. Now, survival is really not what, what we're looking at. And uh, I would urge that everybody also stop looking at just survival, but rather what are they, what can you do to um, recover? and then grow, because we all have to do that if, if um, as a country, uh, as an economy, we're going to get through, through this, this COVID. COVID is the, is the new norm. COVID is not going anywhere for, for quite some time. There's some of the things that we've, we've done is that first and foremost, we've accepted change. And we've accepted that change keeps changing. We have had to sift and analyze the excessive amount of information available with regard to this change. We have set up teams. We have accelerated digitalization. And we have urged our, our managers and leaders to, to become inspirational and motivational, and to look for new paths to follow, new products to go into. Uh, we've urged them to be agile, accountable, and to rethink their business models, their supply chains, and their partners and, 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 and stakeholders. But above all, We've urged them to increase uh, customer centricity. So we've stopped. Oh, yay. Things are falling apart. We can't survive. To try to looking for those opportunities that, that will take us through this period and into the next one of growth. Irene, I think I'll stop there. And, yes. and, and give the others time to speak since we've only got an hour. Uh, yes, um, thank you, um, Ambassador. Um, stick around because I'm sure there's some people that will want to ask you some questions. Um, John, um, then you're going to introduce um, our next guest. Absolutely, Jeff Odundo and uh, um, Ambassador, thank you very much. You've just made my talk for me. That's very, very good to, to, to hear. You're a true ambassador. Jeff Odundo. Oh, thank you, John. <laughs> and thank you, Irene. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak on your platform. Uh, and today I'm very delighted to be speaking in a very eminent forum. Um, and uh, I think what, one thing that um, uh, this new, new normal has given us is that we don't know where the cutoff is. So we're still at work. Um, so, uh, on our part, um, I've been part of a very robust uh, response team uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with the COVID crisis because we are really in, in the epicenter of it from an economic perspective as a key market infrastructure. And uh, what uh, a number of our companies are doing, and first of all, is to say that uh, they have responded extremely well. Uh, if you look at the national response, um, Fund, which is currently chaired by Jane Karuku, who comes from the listed community. Uh, there's been a very big play by the private sector and especially the listed companies in that, in that particular fund. 
And uh, that's just the commitment that um, the private sector has and is playing towards supporting the government in um, dealing with this pandemic. Um, so immediately we, we, we went into this crisis. I think you're all aware that uh, the market got uh, very, very affected. Uh, on the very day, the 12th of March, we experienced a very deep dive or a deep drop in the market, almost 5% during the trading sessions. And we had to put in place um, a circuit breaker or what you call a halt um, for about uh, 15 minutes to allow the market to respond to this. Now, that was not unique to us. As you know, markets worldwide were lightly affected and um, a number of them had to have circuit breakers put in place. Uh, and that immediately um, created a situation where um, the market itself and the listed companies, we all had to move, move very, very rapidly towards responding to this crisis. And uh, what we saw within our, the listed community is all the companies that we, we, we work with, um, including ourselves, had to immediately affect our business continuity plans. And just like what Ambassador has spoken, uh, a lot of these things, we have them in paper and models and, um, and uh, scenarios that we will do this in event of a crisis, we'll do this in event of a crisis. This COVID crisis moved us right into the live environment. And um, we, we sort of did things that we could never imagine could be done overnight. For instance, um, we moved the market to a full uh, remote trading, uh, right from infrastructure activation to the, the trading itself. And as I speak today, the entire market is trading remotely. We are doing our surveillance remotely. We are doing our uh, activation remotely. Our traders are trading remotely. And the market is actually trading well. Um, as a market, we were also very responsive, noting that um, a number of our listed companies will face challenges in publishing results. We allowed for uh, electronic publishing of results via the social media, via websites. Uh, we also allowed companies to defer their annual general meetings and even allow them to continue uh, with the directors they have in place um, until the AGMs are held. And we've gone further to allow for electronic AGMs. And I'm delighted to say that the first company, Scan Group, has held a very, um, I plan to hold a very, a very successful EGM. And so what this thing has done, it has really, in the first, um, first instance, moved the market or moved companies to appreciate digitization and uh, ability to use um, uh, an electronic or a remote way of working. And, and that has really proved well. We have not seen a company in crisis. Um, a lot of them have, have moved well. The other thing that has brought this is the national response to this crisis. For instance, the funding. Um, you've seen the various sectors respond positively to the funding requests. Um, the private sector has played a big role in creating and supporting the, the national response fund. And that has been helpful because we've realized that we need to, uh, first of all, we need to protect the community. Without the people, we'll have no business. And that has been very, very responsive. Uh, the other thing was, has been about the concern of our people. Nothing matters now if you don't have safety and health for your people. And so the, the response by companies to allow staff to work remotely, to work from home, responding to the health protocols is something we've seen cutting across the entire, the entire uh, community that we, we serve and which has, which has really helped well. Uh, we've seen companies do a lot of scenario planning um, trying because this we really don't know how the uh, crisis will play out. I think nobody can tell how it will end. So constant, constant scenario planning is something we're seeing. We're seeing cutbacks in budgets. We're seeing companies conserving cash. Um, we're seeing um, uh, regular updates and, and really a lot of virtual meetings taking place. And largely because nobody knows how the response will be. And, and really this is uh, something that, uh, that we've seen happening. Uh, we have seen this, what this COVID has done is really make us look internally at ourselves. Let me just give you a perspective. Now, on a regular trading period, uh, we, we normally see in foreign investors uh, occupy almost 75% of our trading volume. What we've seen now, our local investors have come in stronger, and now we're seeing almost a 60-40 split. Uh, so Kenyans have realized this is our country. We need to invest in our own businesses. We need to support our own businesses. And it's not happening here only. I think there's a high level of patriotism coming through out of this COVID. There's a lot of focus on uh, 
building our industry, supporting our local industry, and that is coming out well, which is uh, for a long time, there's been a heavy dependency on imports and that kind of thing. So we're hoping to see a bit more local content development um, and, and growth of our industries. So this COVID situation has totally changed our lives. We believe it's a new normal. I think Kenya should at best prepare, it's a reality. We need to adapt to it and we need to contain it. And really that's uh, how we've seen our immediate response. And we're happy to be part of this discussion and really get to hear uh, John's perspectives as a seasoned uh, investment banker on, uh, and, and, and really take advantage of the opportunity that we have in the capital markets to really uh, uh, use local capital to, to really um, expand our industry. Thank you very much, Irene, and thank you, John. Thank you, Jeff. I knew Jeff would end with a plug for the NSE, which is fine. <laughs> he, 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 he has to sing for his, for his, uh, his, uh, his uh, supper. I'm very conscious that we have an hour of which half has gone, or or just about half. Um, what we've heard from Ambassador Awari and from Jeff Odundo are really the meat of what uh, of, of, of our subjects today. We've had uh, the magic words, business continuity, cash is king, accept change, digitalization, leadership, flexibility and agility, customer centricity, and the and the and the and the need to move with speed to cope with uh, with uh, with uh, with a crisis like COVID. I think it'll be far more useful that I don't say all this. I'll give you two a, a two two three minute context and then uh, invite questions. Um, Mike Eldon had said I, I operate at the nexus of government and private sector. I do. And this crisis has, has found me very much, very deeply in there. So I've had the experience of uh, a, near a near catastrophic event like Kenya Airways, where I'm, the, I'm on the board. No one probably, with the exception of perhaps of restaurants, no sector has been hit as hard as airlines. And the fact that Kenya Airways was not in a, in a great shape in the first place makes the, the, the blow even harder. I've, um, I've been, uh, I'm at Kenya Pipeline, where paradoxically, the fact that we had, without calling it business continuity, done a tremendous amount of work in ensuring that we had uh, a, a I, a, uh, a pretty healthy cash reserve, notwithstanding government reading it for 12 billion the, the, uh, the, uh, the other day, we still found ourselves with 10 billion when the crisis came. That has kept us in good stead. And even though we are only operating at 40% the manpower, we haven't sent anybody home, we haven't done any pay cuts, and we are still paying our casuals even though they are not they even though they aren't working. Um, I'm involved in the telecom sector in Wananchi, and there we've seen a complete, the complete opposite. The demand has rocketed because uh, Wananchi is the leading home fiber uh, company. And uh, I think we, we had a threefold explosion in demand, uh, a very, very different ex ex experience. I am also involved in base titanium, where uh, the collapse of other export sectors in Kenya means that people like Bayes, who are a major exporter with $250 million a year, uh, have become incredibly important to, to replace tourism and, and such things. But I think what I'd like to dwell on for, for another couple of minutes is the work we've been doing with government um, personally, also as KEPSA, and also in other, other shall we say, roles which are best left vague. Um, and what's been remarkable is the government's flexibility. It's been incredible how quickly government has reacted in its operations, but beyond operations, what government has done, and and this is this is what this is this is really the message that I want to leave everybody with. The government has made a, a, a leap of imagination. It's gone beyond thinking, how do we survive COVID? 
Two, what will the new world, post-COVID world look like? And where do we place Kenya in that? And I think that uh, for you as business leaders, if you're going to keep your, your head level as the, as the topic had it, if you're going to find a sense out of what it looks like senselessness, I think government's approach to saying, what, where does, does this leave Kenya? How are we placed in the supply chain of, uh, of, uh, or in the global supply chain? Where will the manufacturers be leaving um, China for whatever reason? Where, where will they disperse to? Uh, are our logistics good enough to cope with the demands uh, suddenly for countries which no longer have airlines flying to them and therefore have to use Mombasa and, and, and such places? And that sort of thinking is going on in an incredible way in government. And if there's one message I, I want to leave to you, to leave with you, is you should be doing the same kind of thinking. Secondly, government is also thinking of how to cope in a world where aid money may not be as readily available, where there is a, a tremendous competition for capital. So all these stories you read in the headlines of waste and graft and, and what have you, suddenly have come center stage as government start, realizes that it, it doesn't have the tax revenues it used to have. So how on earth do we attract uh, investment into Kenya? How do we make those necessary infrastructure and other investments without having tax revenues to back it up. And I think you will begin hearing far more of things like PPPs, which will be opportunities for, uh, for, uh, for, for people like uh, the business leaders represented here. In short, government is seeing opportunity where you would have thought it would see crisis and would be paralyzed. And it is seeing opportunity because it is looking at a post-COVID world and Kenya's place in it. And I'm hoping that the, 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 the companies and people represented in this talk today are going to switch, are going to keep level-headed, are going to think through not just how do we survive, as Ambassador Aori said, we must go beyond survival to creative thinking, to seeing where the advantages would be in digitalization, in more manufacturing, in onshoring more, more manufacturing, in the demand suddenly by Europe for more food because they, they no longer admit migrant laborers are from Eastern Europe, and so on and so on and so forth. How do we satisfy all that? That's my message, but as a bet, <laughs> but uh, as I said, our limited time means that it is far better for us, and by us I mean you too, Dennis and, uh, and, uh, and, and Jeff, for us to hear, hear from you. So Irene, that's my, my, my message to you and to, 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 to the audience, and it's back to you and to Cecilia. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, John. Um, can you hear me? I can, yes. Yes, I can. yes, we can. Oh, okay, cool. Um, well, um, what I'll suggest is, um, Cecilia, um, you will lift some of the questions from, uh, from the chat section. Um, but before we do, John, um, there were some questions from Jeff, Jeff Murage. Um, I don't know if you have them in front of you. No, can you just read them out i'm not um, i'm not i'm not just too old to remember uh, okay cool forget. um jeff um mm. you're on here um could you unmute yourself and ask the questions directly jeff Muragi. yeah yeah so <clears throat> i hope you can hear me very well yeah. um so my first question was um in the short term up to maybe end of this year 2020 what would be the general advice to smes especially where supply chains are clearly disrupted by the current situation, um, tourism, you know, agribusiness and manufacturing, where SMEs? 
Well, I'm going to be tough. I think, I, I think there is no question that we have entered an era of difficulties for the SMEs. I know the government has come up with certain steps and there are issues, there, there, are, there, are, there are plans by central bank to bring in international financiers to help the SMEs. But the reality is that the disruption of supply chains and the fact that your end customers may have stopped, may have stopped working means that the world is permanently changed. There will be losers. And I think for the SMEs, other than hoping you will survive and, 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 and here you, your banks and creditors and others will play a key role, I think it is a question of taking a step back and saying, quite frankly, am I in the right sector for the emerging economy? If I am a supplier of, of product to an airline, uh, is the world of airlines going to be one of passengers or is the world of airlines going to be one of cargo or more cargo? And if so, is what I am providing going to be uh, to be uh, to, 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 to satisfy them. And by the way, it's not just SMEs. One of the world's largest uh, private equity firms called Carlyle is trying to get out of a deal where it had, it had planned to buy the travel business of American Ex Express for, se for several hundred million dollars. And the reason it is doing so, it had foreseen just looking at its own travel that uh, business travel would increase and people would ask for this and then COVID hit. And now <laughs> there is no business travel and if business travel resumes, it will be very different. So, so Carl and I have taken the brutal step of saying to the, uh, to the sellers that, I'm sorry, a force majeure has occurred and we are out. And of course they're in court. But that sort of approach, that sort of a brutal, swift approach by Carlisle is probably the same sort of approach that an SME has had to take. There are going to be, to be losers coming out of this crisis. Hopefully yours will not be one of them. Hopefully your bankers and others will carry you through because you have an essential uh, commodity or service you are providing. But SMEs, the, 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 the broad advice is be absolutely cold-blooded and ruthless. Um, Cecilia, I'm hoping you have some questions with you. Yeah, I'm going to consolidate here. Uh, Michael Hopkins, uh, Dr. Beatrice and Christine. So uh, piggybacking on what you're saying in terms of looking at new opportunities, especially manufacturing, uh, knowing that a lot of the cost is not just business disruption, but healthcare, the cost associated with masks, equipment, and all of that, and rising. How do we create an opportunity in manufacturing for that, looking at that as a sector, and then spread that out as sort of uh, operational local manufacturing capabilities that can rapidly diffuse? Um, ambassador, as one who is in manufacturing, can you do you want do you want to feel that, or has he left? I'm, I'm, I'm here. I just keep ah. zooming in and out. I don't know why. Right. Um, my, 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 again, it's 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 all about we we looking at your uh, at your products, we looking at your business model, we, we looking at your supply chains, uh, the partners that, that, that you're going to, to work with, um, and coming up with, with new opportunities, new products um, that, 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 that are in demand. Because despite the big disruption that, that, that COVID is, has brought and is all about, there is still going to be, um, and there is 
consumption and consumption that will grow. You just have to move into uh, satisfying that the, the demand uh, from from that consumption. Uh, in Kenya, in Kenya, I would uh, I would urge you to look uh, very much at at manufacturing linked to to agriculture because that's 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 our primary activity um, and and that, that will provide the the raw material that that, that 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 you would require without having to to depend on on um, a supply chain from 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 out from outside John, I'm sure you want to add to that. You're and let me give you a couple of, I was about to say, I was, I was saying that Dennis is, is absolutely correct. Let me give you a couple of real live examples. Before the, uh, before COVID struck, Kenya Pipeline had never made a sanitizer in its to 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 save itself. We've made a million and a half liters of of sanitizers, which we, we've given away. Today, I, I had a call, had called from about five manufacturers who told me, uh, "Can you sell us your ethanol?" And I said, "Actually, our ethanol is 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 about to to run out because it was the ethanol that had been seized by the KRA and 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 and, and courts." And and they said. Thank you, because you've shown us that we can make sanitizers and other products uh, uh, using the same process, uh, which will end up with, with them making cosmetics. And they, they are very thankful that we stepped in and, and filled that gap, and they are, they are, they are even more thankful that, that, we, that we are living. We are creating a completely new industry. We've, we've created without and without intending to, a completely new line. And this is a, uh, it's something I, I used to tell people when I was a banker. This is a 300 million people market. These people have to eat, have to cloth, have to ent entertain themselves, have to do all manner of things. A lot of that, of those needs have been satisfied by imports. The disruption of supply chains have taught people that we can actually substitute those imports and we can and 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 and, and, and really step up as quickly as i've said people have have stepped up on the sanitizers it's a question of saying what do people need here what do we import those those statistics are there my my nigerian i have an, a nigerian friend who has set up uh, if a new factory for pasta and another one for, believe it or not, toothpicks, because Nigeria has been importing toothpicks. And now he's, he, that, that, that possibility has gone because of lack of foreign exchange and lack of flights and whatever. So I think I, I cannot emphasize enough that the world is staring at you if you are willing to raise your head above the parapet and, uh, and, uh, and, and crisis of, of COVID-19 COVID and realize that this, that Africa, East Africa has been a consumer heaven, which has been satisfied by other people and now, and now needs to be satisfied by us because, because we can no longer rely on this. Whoever knew that we would not be able to import pharmaceuticals from India without the Minister for Health here making a special call to, uh, uh, to his, his counterpart in India to, 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 to release drugs, which are now being started to be manufactured here. So the, the opportunities are there. It's a question of opening your eyes. Now, of course, everybody will say, yeah, the opportunities are there, but who will finance us and, and so on and so forth, which is where the challenge to, to the bankers and other people with funds has to come in. What are you going to do? So, Ambassador, as chairman of a bank, you also have an, another role to, to, to play. Thank you. Um, thanks, John. I, before you go, I will ask, um, before uh, you leave that question, I'll ask, um, we have highlighted what an opportunity it is, but um, for Kenya, are we, are we leaving some people too far behind that um, even 
buying what they normally would as consumers becomes a problem such that we might manufacture everything that you said and maybe even more but there'll be no takers um is there a risk um through all of this that will leave some people behind and maybe too far behind that they cannot come back make no mistake this this crisis is leaving a lot of people poor and again it is it is it is it's worth noting that government has recognized that uh sam in kepsa will will recall the huge struggle we had to convince government to up cash transfers to those who are truly vulnerable they have done that now uh, I remain of, of a, minor, a minority school that says that maybe we should, uh, we should uh, put the words fiscal cons consolidation uh, to one side for a, for a bit and actually go out there and spend and borrow in order to make people survive. So we are, we are, we do have people who are in real, real, real trouble. But again, you need also to be more nuanced. If you look at the numbers, the real troubled areas are the urban poor. Yeah. Uh, those those who may have lived through the period when Idi Amin was running route in in Uganda. We we'll recall that the one thing that the, the Ugandans never suffered from was a lack of food, because you, 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 Uganda is incredibly, is incredibly fertile. Similarly, you was, the crisis in Kenya, the crisis of the poor, is very much a crisis of the urban poor, of which the majority are in Nairobi and in Mombasa. And because we've recognized that, it is possible uh, especially using um, uh, mobile telephone based technology to target and really reach those poor. And I think if you read the, the stimulus carefully, you'll see that a lot of the stimulus is geared to targeting those who are really in need. We will, we hope we, we will never be able, to be able to reach all of them, but I think that there is no excuse to, today for not being able to reach, to reach those poor. They are poor, they, they have been hit hard. The people who, who live on, da on daily wages or on daily pickings, and, uh, and uh, we do have to take care of them. But the ultimate taking care of them will be in creating those industries that Cecilia was talking about. Cecilia? Uh, piggyback on that before I um, uh, consolidate the next set of questions. Also, something that we did last year, we didn't know it was going to be useful, the Huduma number. Uh, we all registered and that can be tied to blockchain and, and linked to those direct payments and, and managing uh, the situation a little better, I think. So it the is next, already. Uh, it is. It is. Cool. So the, the, that 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 I think addresses because there's a lot of um, anxiety in the group about getting to sort of uh, if, you know truly making sure that we don't create a society in which things that are already bad then there's sort of the those who just get completely abandoned. Um, and along those lines is SMEs uh, being sort of caught in the middle. And here I'm going to summarize. I have Galaxy Note 5 Shoal, I think. Uh, Rupert Litton, Richard Aya, uh, Christine, uh, Alan Olele, and I think Michael Hopkins, I think uh, uh, John already uh, addressed some of what you were saying. So looking at SMEs and production, so a lot of what has been discussed so far has been uh, responses that a large business is capable of responding to. You have more employees, you have larger infrastructure, you have larger markets. If you're an SME and you are starting and you're, you, you are barely getting onto uh, the black side of the books to begin with, and uh, of course, there's going to be fiscal restraint by banks. 
uh, where do you even get the funding to shift and how do you shift and you don't have a market because you're tiny so so how do you operationalize that shift in demand I wish I could answer that question with hope. I am hoping that we will be able to come up with the instruments or the, which is what I know this, the central bank the governor is really working hard to come up with backing from uh, the IFCs and others of this world to be able to provide capital to the SMEs. I think the brutal truth is that the crisis is exposing our 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 SMEs as woefully underfunded, as living hand to mouth, uh, and 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 really one one of the most embarrassing things is that forty years ago, thirty years ago, we had organisations which were a, which 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 used to fund SMEs which we have, have stepped in very smartly now. We need to go back to the future. We, we need to focus on the SMEs. Uh, we have to, be, because at, 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 at the moment they are drowning. So let's hope that we get, A, we get this, fund, this funding arranged that the central bank is working on, and B, that the banks are a good transmission mechanism the banks will have to suspend disbelief in the credit quality of their customers if they are going to help our customers through this hopefully the fund the credit guarantees coming in will be be strong enough to enable banks to do exactly that but we are, they are really in trouble um so um, I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball and predict where the shilling is going to go for now. And I'll ask the same question to, to Jeff. <laughs> yeah. When I, was a, when I was a banker, I, I, I learned that only fools predict where currencies are going to be at any one time. But we've got this incredible situation where, yes, our key exports, uh, tourism has, has basically collapsed, um, remittances are in trouble because the people who remit money to Kenya are themselves struggling in the States or, 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 or in the Gulf or, or wherever, wherever they are. Um, horticulture was hit hard, but is, 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 is starting to, uh, to move again. Um, coffee and tea, we still have to see whether they will suffer the same. So we, we, we've got a, we've got a, we, 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 we've got a foreign exchange supply problem. The obvious of that, of course, is that we've got oil prices uh, for an oil consumer like ourselves have moved in the right direction. And also, unfortunately, the, 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 the depressed demand caused by all these economic slowdown we've been talking about has also meant that we've got far, far smaller uh, requirements for foreign currency. Plus, I think the big eaters in terms of, in, of, of government infra, infrastructure projects, we now would see that. So, I could, I, it's, it's arguable that the, sh the shilling is more manageable than many African currencies. Uh, I don't think we are going to see 110, 20, 30, uh, a collapse to 500, as some people in, in London were, 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 were telling me they, they, they would see. I think that uh, the, the, the standby lines and the, the lines of support we've just received from the IMF and others combined with the depressed demand for, for currencies, combined with the probability that we are going to be able to Reprofile our foreign currency debt and reduce the, the pressure on the, on both the the fiscal deficit and on the currency mean that we are probably going to wallow around where we are through to the end of the year. Um, Jeff, um, do you have a view? I think uh, John has laid it well. Um, I, I think he's basically spoken on how uh, the um, the various factors that affect the currency are playing out. Um, I, I would like 
I would like to agree with him. Um, it's likely going to remain within the target range as way it is right now, um, primarily because of the uh, de depressed activity that we're seeing, uh, low demand for for imports. Um, um, I, primarily, the um, a lot of a lot of internal generated funding. I think government is going to focus more on domestic funding options. Uh, we are trying to encourage them to look at um, uh, local capital market financing to support their programs. Um, a bit more sort of the allocation of funding from uh, development funding and to a bit more recurrent expenditure uh, and those kind of things. So in my view, I think it's going to remain within the target range. I think Central Bank is doing a good job uh, to really play, uh, allow the normal market operations and metrics to to support the currency. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, liquidity being injected in the market. They are, they're very active in the market and that's really helped. Um, so I'm in agreement with, uh, with what the, the, the uh, target ranges are. I think anything, uh, I don't see it playing out worse than uh, what everybody is expecting, but uh, within, within the, the current ranges. What is everybody uh, expecting? <laughs> <laughs> or what, what John talked about. I think, um, I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, predictions, but I don't totally agree. I don't agree with them at all. I think Central Bank is, is really doing what they're meant to do. Uh, to the point about um, what SMEs should do, I want to just say one thing. Um, this is a time, what I'll call a reset. I think businesses have got to start rethinking their businesses. I mean, we, we're going into a new, a new space. And those businesses that will not move from that um, current situation to really remodel themselves or to look at other options and other opportunities will really um, collapse. So this is a time to reset your business, to rethink your plans. I think throw away the strategic plans you had and re remodel them again. Uh, and we at the NSC are offering an opportunity for SME companies to really come and understand uh, opportunities in the capital markets through what we call the Booker program. It's not just a market to train you how to access capital, but even how to run your business, how to understand your balance sheet, how to look at other opportunities, how to expand and diversify your scope. And so I think the businesses that are gonna survive are those that are going to rethink their models, those that are going to be more responsive to issues around sustainability and working with the community, and those that are going to be really innovative to and, and accept, and, uh, accept that digitization is going to be the way forward. And so I think that is how we're going to see uh, things play out. Um, Jeff, and for the region, do you see um, everything that we've said tonight playing out in our neighbor's country, uh, Uganda, Tanzania? We're because for most SMEs that hope to go regional or that are already regional, um, what's the view there? Uh, one of the things that I think we are, we also hoping to see is a lot of inter-regional inter trade and even inter-African trade. I think uh, we are not trading enough as Africans. I think now that we have all these agreements signed in place, this is a time that we have to really uh, make it work. And I think just as the way COVID has pushed us into full BCP, we believe we'll also be full into full trading uh, regionally. And so uh, our expectation is to see a lot of inter-regional uh, inter trade even within East Africa, um, and that should help the companies grow. I think there's going to be a lot of in-country focus um, by all countries to try and see how can their own industries expand. But I think there's need for a better regional integration so that we can see we have got enough, a good population, 300 million people. We have capital that we can tap and, and generate locally. And we have the capacity and expertise to really um, build our local industry. So I think there's a better, bigger case for inter-regional trade and even an African trade at a bigger level. Okay, and um, as you can see uh, with the time, we have gone a little over. So what I wanna ask, Mike Eldon, are you still there? Um, what I want to ask all the speakers today, including Mike Eldon, is a phrase or maybe just a few words to say. What would you leave us with tonight that will help us make this just a little bit better? I'll start with you, Jeff, because you're already there, and then uh, I'll go back to Dennis then to Mike, and then um, close off with John. So, Jeff, what's the one, um, if we take something from this session today, what would you say it is? I think we should, we should never let a crisis go to waste. Um, <laughs> I like what John said about government thinking opportunistically and not thinking pessimistically. That is the way we should all think as, 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 a, as, a, as a sort of a, a new a rallying call for all our companies. Thank you. And Ambassador? 
Um, I'd say reboot, accelerate digitalization, become much more agile and accountable. And yes, let's take advantage of, of your new opportunities that this crisis has brought. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And Mike, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, the, the word that I keep thinking about, and I've written about this in, in my columns, and I'm very much involved with it in my social cohesion committee of NCIC and where I'm a director and a consultant, is the word trust. Trust in the time of COVID. Michael Hopkins and I talk a lot about this and uh, in terms of our Institute for Responsible Leadership and the cultures, the subcultures, the countries, the leaderships where there is trust, where people are trustworthy and trusting are those that will suffer least during this time and will emerge with even greater comparative advantage as this crisis gradually fades, not disappears, but fades. So um, what I have seen in organizations where I'm a director is that because they went into this with higher trust, things like working from home and dealing with customers and suppliers, whether domestically or internationally, because these have been healthy cultures, these organizations are doing rather well and certainly much better than might have been expected, much better than many of their competitors. People are gathering closer together, the pyramids are flattening, the uh, collaboration is becoming greater between field office and head office, between board and management, um, uh, between different functions, the silos have, have faded away. This is the good news of the cultural strengthening that in already healthy organizations has enabled them to keep going better than others. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, that's definitely something to, to take with us. And so, John, um, I have the benefit of you being my mentor, so every now and again I get a nugget of wisdom. But very, this is a different time. What would you leave us with? Very difficult to beat what, uh, what Mike and Dennis and Jeff have said, so I will plagiarize from Warren Buffett that it is when the tide goes out that you discover who's been swimming naked. Uh, we've been found, many, many of us, to be honest, I think if we are honest, we've been found unready, but now we will learn how to make sure we have our swimming trunks on and are ready for whatever. So I think that what this crisis offers is to use Dennis's word, is a chance to reset and i think if there if 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 if, if, if just like mike has has emphasized trust i would say that this really does offer everybody especially the the, the smes who are clearly a major concern of many in this audience a chance to reset we've been found to be less or more prepared and uh, we but we also can see that now that the tide has gone out, we aren't the only ones who were swimming naked and uh, there are opportunities galore everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, Cecilia, do you wanna say two words before I wrap it up? Cecilia? Oh, did we lose her? Um, and so, um, yeah, mm -hmm. are you there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, say two words before I wrap it up. Uh, just a, a continuation. It's, there's a, a sort of a, an ongoing for a, a follow-up session. A lot of requests, I think, uh, translating again, uh, SMEs uh, in terms of support services. Yes, financial. Uh, yes, business operational efficiency, but they also need data on markets by industry. Uh, and uh, retail, textile, uh, healthcare, and also we've... You disappeared. Oh, she's... Uh... Cecilia, we're losing you. Yeah. Sorry. 
uh, yeah. to be able to see what the market data that enables an SME to see what those opportunities are. Sounds to me as though you've just described an, an SME opportunity in data. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, and so, um, obviously, one hour is, uh, was never going to be enough. So what we are going to do is assess the situation, see how far we go in the current um, scene, and then reconvene after maybe a month or two and get to assess where we are and what we've done differently, what advantages we've taken of the opportunity, and reassess whether we need to... Um, like Ambassador said, reset again or keep going. And so um, mine is to thank everyone that turned up. Um, thank you for making these um, quite robust with your chats and questions. And to the speakers, um, I'm glad I got to get all of you here tonight because um, it was a good, it was all complimentary that you got to address um, all the areas that needed addressing this evening. Um, I thank you, and I will be calling you on you again. Yeah. I, I read you, you're forgetting that men have no choice now. We are at home. We are, you know, it's <laughs> so easy to get us, huh? you, yes, you're, you're getting your way so easily. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I'll take advantage of that and reconvene before we... <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. And so with that, uh, we will um, come to the end of this session and look out for the next one next month. And we'll talk a little more about, we'll hone in on SMEs. Uh, Ambassador, Jeff, Mike, I hope you at least tune in or at least give us a few words even on that one. We appreciate yes. um, your wisdom all the time and we, we always look forward to when you can come through. And so for tonight, thank you very much. And um, it's a wrap for now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Bye. Dennis, friend. Thank you, Jeff. John, Mike. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I'm just hanging on till uh, everybody exits so that uh, because of the recording, but as soon as that everybody exits, then I'll, I'll end the, the session. Okay, it was a nice session. Great, great. Helpful? Cecilia, thank you very much, and uh, and Irene. Um, a month seems like too far away, but hope to see you sooner. <laughs> thank you.